Wow, a priest of orgasm. There were seven women, they were naked. They had black veils, pussies facing outward. The men who bought in, maybe a quarter million each, I mean, literally exalted as priests, because as kind of like a, a social reward for having committed their lives, they would rotate every few minutes, like who they were stroking. It just seemed like a giant orgy. I mean, I realize I'm saying this like as if it's normal, but it, you know, it's obviously not. <laughs> so casual. Yeah. <laughs> just to me, this was not nearly the, you know, this wasn't close to the weirdest thing. Hey guys, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions and organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. If you're listening only and you want to see our faces, head on over to my YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can see the whole thing, where you can like, you can subscribe, hit the bell so you don't miss any episodes, and uh, leave a comment if, if you like what we're talking about or join in on the conversation. It would mean a lot. Um, today's guest. Wow, guys, this is going to be a fun one. So, you know, I talk about sex a lot on my channel. This time we're going to go into what happens when sex becomes too much and exploited. So we've talked about what happens when you uh, are not allowed to have sex and everything. But what if you have a cult that is surrounded by sex? In fact, it is built on sex. It is built on female orgasm, which sounds amazing, right? All the things that I love. But this is the story of what happens when it gets too distorted, it becomes violent, it becomes dangerous, and today's guest was actually involved in this cult, so I cannot wait to hear his perspectives, I can't wait to hear um, what happened when he was involved, the, the nitty gritty of it all, the reason that we uh, came in contact is because he was actually part of the Netflix documentary called Orgasm Inc. The Story of One Taste. We have a pleasure deficit disorder in this country. I think that there is a cure, and that cure is female orgasm. She really was a celebrity. I had seen her TED Talk 30 times. It was all about exploring orgasm, exploring pleasure. Two FBI agents, and they wanted to talk to me about what happened at One Taste. What is it about One Taste that people are drawn to? So, thank you so much for joining us. Ruan Mipagala. Yeah, thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Yeah, of course. I was so thrilled when you reached out and I checked out the documentary on Netflix and I was just fuming with things to say. <laughs> so <laughs> this is very exciting for me. Um, I can't wait to dive into it more. So, man, where do we even start with this? Let's start with what is One Taste, who started it, and kind of just give a brief overview. So I'm curious from your perspective, what was kind of like the sales pitch that they gave to you? Uh, well, One Taste was and is a wellness company that focuses on female orgasm, a different definition of the word orgasm than what we mostly use. Um, and they teach about conscious communication, sexuality, getting in touch with your emotions, general personal development stuff too. And I found them, I mean, I found them when I was uh, first 19, I saw the founder's TED Talk, uh, Nicole Daydone was the founder. She had a viral TED Talk in 2017. I was a sophomore in college. I watched it like, I just kept watching it over and over again because I clicked on it because it said orgasm, but then I rewatched it because it touched something. Like it really did touch me. And, I, and it, it touched something in me about like connection and vulnerability and really like really connecting with people, which is not something I really thought about before as a 19 year old young man, but it was something I definitely needed. So at 24, when they came to New York, because they were based in San Francisco, um, I immediately started going to their events. And I felt then, and I honestly still feel now, that they were really onto something cutting edge in terms of personal development. Like I've been to so many different kinds of workshops. And I, you know, even though they have done a lot of uncool things, I still need to credit them because they also like really helped me and many other people. Okay. Yeah. We're, Definitely going to talk on the positives and the negatives, because just like any cult, there's always some sort of positive or else they wouldn't get people to join, right? right. <laughs> there's got to be something that draws people in that they can benefit from. And then usually that's when there becomes a huge uh, power differential over the people. They end up spending a lot of their money or giving their time, effort and finances to this cult. And it becomes just this overwhelmingly bad thing in their life until they 
they realize that they need to get out, which you did. So I'm, yeah, I'm excited to talk about the positives and the negatives within it. Um, okay, so Nicole Daydon, she does this TED Talk. She's mm. incredibly charismatic. She basically, everyone talked about her as being this presence in the room. When they go to these workshops with her, they just feel like she is a force. And I mean, most cult leaders are, right? <laughs> Um, so I'm curious your perspective on her because, I mean, this documentary was very unkind in the way that they presented her. Her ex-husband said that she just wanted to manipulate people or she was a con artist. And some of the things that she said, um, which this is actually a really good moment to say trigger warning, um, content warning. We are going to be talking about sexual abuse, um, rape things of that matter. If you are not comfortable, please skip this episode. Um, We are talking about very sensitive topics. She said something about her father, who was a convicted pedophile, um, child molester, who she said, well, he's just in such an expanded state. He's in the fourth dimension and, and today's mundane laws just can't contain him. And I'm thinking, what? No, 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 no. Like, I think most people, hopefully, everyone can agree that assaulting a child is not okay in any state of consciousness that you are in. That's not okay. So she's known to have said some really appalling things, and we'll talk about the ways that she likes to rework different words to make them mean something different, to make you dissociate from the reality of words such as rape, and how that affects people. So all of that to say... I'm really curious to know your personal experience with her, if you had any one-on-one experiences with her and the type of impression that you got when you were involved in One Taste. Yeah, uh, I didn't have a ton of like direct interactions with her. I mean, you have to kind of go pretty deep into One Taste to, to have that experience. But my very first uh, How to Ohm class, it's uh, orgasmic meditation is the practice they teach. I could fill that in later. Um, she was still teaching those classes back then. Eventually she phased out of that. And she would go around the room saying something to each student. And she did have an incredible ability. Like if you imagine like the best kind of therapist who can read a person and empathize with them and tell them what they really need to hear. She had that ability times like a thousand. And she really could read you accurately, feel what you're feeling, and then tell you the thing that you perhaps needed to hear. And especially in the beginning, like if you if you think of it as a sales funnel, like in the beginning of the funnel, they're really just helping you, right? Because they're not going to get you to go deeper if they don't help you. Mm-hmm. And she said some things to me that were really, honestly, life-changing. Like she really empathized with me, felt where I was, you know, said the thing that I couldn't admit to myself. And it was incredibly impressive. Like it seems psychic when someone can empathize with you so deeply, but it was also a skill that they trained in one taste. Empathy, that is. Oh, that's interesting. And I'm wondering if you noticed, the documentary touches on this, how she would pull, it's called pulling desires, Mm -hmm. how she would pull something out of somebody, but eventually the person is like, no, that isn't what I actually wanted. That's what Nicole wanted. That's what she wanted me to say. And once I finally said what she wanted me to say, then it was like, okay, you got it. You won. (laughs) You did the thing. So I'm curious if you noticed any of that. Or um, or did anyone actually just stand up and be like, no, I don't want that? <laughs> did anyone stand up to her? Or was everyone pretty much enthralled by this thing that she did? That kind of thing happened on every level, not just like Nicole to a person, but like the people under Nicole to the people under them. Like there was a whole, you know, it's a pretty deep hierarchy. And, you know, I, I'll, I'll be honest, like I even did this to other people, like where I kind of wanted them to do a thing. And it wasn't super conscious. And that was, that was one of the things I was disappointed that the documentary kind of skipped over. Maybe it was because it was too complex. That everybody, other than maybe Nicole, but pretty much everybody thought they were helping people mm. through manipulating them and getting to do certain things. Like we all were like, we're pushing people into their fears. We're getting them to do the things they're afraid to do, which is, of course, true on some level. But it also becomes twisted when it's like, the thing that's benefiting them always ends up profiting one taste. And it, and it is kind of a complicated um, gray area, if you will. But as far as pulling desires, 
Yeah, I mean, especially when you're deeper in one taste and, you know, you go in with this ethos of everyone should live by their desire, which is what they preach. And it's very, it's a beautiful idea. And every, of course, everyone wants to live that way. But then over time, they kind of change what you want. So you're still acting on your own desire, but now what you wanted maybe wasn't what you wanted earlier. And it's kind of hard to, it's really confusing actually, because you, you know, if you do really feel like you want to do a certain course or even sleep with a certain person that maybe you didn't, weren't interested before, who's to say like, what's the line of where it's yours versus not? It's, it's, it's very hard to tell. And even with like, you know, in a non-cult setting, this is what advertising does, right? They get you to want things you didn't previously want. Is that wrong or evil? Well, it depends. And, and one taste just did that, like, and I think all cults do that to the next level because they can control your whole reality. Mm -hmm. I think what happens is, and this is in every cult too, there isn't a problem until they present you with the problem. Like some people were saying in the documentary that um, they would expose their deepest, darkest fears and then she would amplify them and say, well, do you want this forever? Do you want to fix it? So they they offer the problem and they're the only ones that can offer the solution. And so you mm -hmm. feel like you have to join and explore or else you're never going to get to this point of enlightenment or orgasm or whatever it is, self-discovery that you are so desperately looking for. And I wanted to talk about how they target specific people. Um, they started in Silicon Valley, right, where people have a lot of money and sh <laughs> these things are not cheap. So they're charging, what, minimum 15000 to get in and to be a part of this upwards. I mean, I saw a membership that was 60000 for an annual thing. How I mean, how are they getting people to pay this much money? Yeah, uh, well, it's like a, it is a sales funnel in that the first class costs 150 bucks, and that's a stretch for a lot of okay. people, but people eventually say yes to that. And then the next thing is a little bit more expensive and a little bit more expensive. And, you know, this is not something uh, unique to cults. Like if you look at anything in the personal development industry, it's kind of normal to spend a thousand bucks a day for a work type of workshop, right? You know, Tony Robbins events are all priced similarly. And not, this is not to say that it's right or it's wrong, but what they are uh, promising is something intangible, which is why people will spend, you know, many times their, let's say, daily income on something like that. It's like they're giving you something that can change your life for the better. And what's the, what's the price of that? I mean, you know, it's like the MasterCard commercial, you know? <laughs> and I feel like I jumped over the main part of this whole cult, which I, I did not explain at all. They are selling how to make a woman orgasm in 15 minutes. And then I, I think there's a lot more levels above that, but it starts with what is an orgasm, what is pleasure, um, teaching these men how to get women off, which I was watching the first part of the documentary. I was like, hmm, should I be taking notes? Like, this is really interesting. I feel like everyone should know how to do this, <laughs> which is why it's such a bummer that things got so out of hand because I think initially the information that she was offering was beneficial and it is helpful to people. And I do believe you can release trauma, um, stored trauma in the body through orgasm. And it can be this multidimensional experience. And you can form deep, deep connections with people or your partner or if you're polyamorous or however you choose to express yourself in your relationships, you can form those connections so deeply through orgasm. So yeah, an orgasm cult. But I want to talk about with you how um, how that changed you or transformed you, or if it did, or maybe it didn't. And if you really did learn a lot about female sexuality and if it did help your sex life, I mean, is that too personal? No. <laughs> like, <laughs> let's get into this. Yeah, so they, they taught this practice called orgasmic meditation, which is, I mean, that label is Nicole's creation, but uh, it has a history going back to the 60s, uh, with Morehouse, which is another organization that taught something called deliberate orgasm. There's many offshoots like in the 60s and 70s. Nicole basically repackaged it to be not a weird hippie thing and something that can be sold to like a normal woman and accepted by a normal woman in like a maybe even in a corporate setting. And um, it's a practice that, you know, it is 
I do think it delivers most of what it promised in that it, it does teach a man intuition. I, you actually are meditating on a woman's body in such a way that you're really paying attention moment to moment, like the slightest bit of feed, like sensory feedback. So like moment to moment, you're like really learning to pay attention to a woman, which most guys, you know, that's just not inherent to us. And of course, that's super beneficial. Like even outside of the bedroom is beneficial to be able to really pay attention to someone and really like sense their emotions and really empathize. And so, of course, it was super beneficial to my my sex life, to my my social life. You know, um, I think I was a I, honestly. It sounds weird, but I think I became like a better son and a better like family member through this process, just because I wasn't closed off to my feelings and I wasn't closed off to being empathic. Um, so yeah, I mean that was pretty cool. I mean that, that they did really deliver on a lot. Wow, that's so interesting. So I'm curious then what the levels looked like because I think they only briefly touched on it and maybe they just jumped around in the documentary, but uh, maybe you can lay this out for me. So the first step really is once you pay into this program, because you did the $15,000 one, right? Eventually, yeah. That was like, that's like step two. That's step two. $15,000 well, is step two? I guess two? step three. All right. So to really go to the beginning, <laughs> there's what was called turn on events, okay. which were like $10 weekly social events. Um, they were modeled after another type of event by, I think by Morehouse, which I mentioned called Mark Groups, which, which they're kind of like intense communication. It's like, a, it's like a, almost like icebreaker games, but like that go really vulnerable, really fast. So like people get kind of a high from that because that's not normally how people talk, but everyone kind of wants to talk that way. Um, from there, they sell you to the Ohm class, which for me at the time was a hundred bucks. I think it eventually was 150 or 200 uh, when they became more popular. And then they pitch you on other things. Like there's some other short classes, but basically the next level is the coaching program, which was a year long program for $15,000. And I do want to say, you know, this is again, not saying it's right or wrong as far as pricing, but if you look at anything else in personal development for a year long program, that's kind of normal. You know, if you even if you look at like a yoga teacher training, it's basically that much per day or that, you know, that's like kind of within the normal range for something like that, that long. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I literally said to them, the salesperson who enrolled me, I don't have that much money. I was 24. I was also, I was semi-employed. Um, there's no way I'm going to pay for this thing. And she said, no problem. Let's just have a conversation. And then I gave her my credit card and then I, I went into debt <laughs> over it. Like immediately it's like. And, you know, honestly, I don't regret that because it was a lot of money and it did put me in debt. But for that, that initial purchase, I should say, I did get basically what I hoped for, which was like to be thrown in a totally new reality and put in an adventure that really shook me and kind of forced me to grow. Um, there's other things that I wish didn't happen, but like, I don't, I don't regret that expenditure at all, to be honest. Interesting. So at what point, because there's a very uh, graphic part of the documentary that's peppered throughout, where there's just like a, a big room of people with chairs, like a presentation, and then up at the front is a woman who is naked from the waist down, spread eagle, and then there's a guy rubbing her clit. And I'm like, when does that happen? Because that is very, <laughs> I mean, with how much sex is kind of shoved down our throats within the media and whatever, you would think that I wouldn't be so shy to that. But when I first saw it, I was like, wow, that's like really in your face because you never really see full frontal nudity on TV. Yeah. So to be up close and personal to a woman who is not like askew to the audience, but just straight on like she's about to have a baby, spread eagle about to orgasm, like that was really intense for me. And I wonder, I'm curious your perspective if if that's part of the shock value to it, where you're like, oh, like we're doing it here. We're not just going to talk about doing it. We're going to actually be rubbing some clitorises like clitori later. <laughs> oh, what was that experience like for you? And, and when does that come into the whole, like the hierarchy, the levels, the system? That's uh, that's at the initial Saturday class. It's like step two, if you will. Or oh, step wow. One. And that was, you know, when I was on the sales team for One Taste Later, that's like a pivotal moment that, I mean, it is it is a shock thing. It is like shock, but like, you know, the way they would put it is that it's a lot of sensation, you know, in their terminology. It's a lot of sensation to see a woman 
for the first time in a public setting with a bunch of strangers uh, in orgasm, right? That's like, that's something you never forget. And right. for someone, uh, and I think a lot of people, including myself, was like, are they really going to do this? Like, like they said so, but are they gonna, and then and they do it. And you're like, oh, like I'm feeling some things. I'm feeling feelings. Like you can't help it, right? <laughs> of course. And uh, it is, it was, I mean, so everything in one taste had, tr- like nothing was, in my opinion, total bullshit. Like there, there is something like that's kind of beautiful in a sense about seeing someone so physically vulnerable and it does give you feels, right? I think, I mean, I, as a, as an employee for them later, I saw a lot of women like burst into tears watching that because maybe she never was able to expose herself or whatever baggage people have, right? Like Mm -hmm. there was something freeing about that. And that experience was used to drive sales. Because if you, if you have this weird experience that is like kind of eye opening and someone says, hey, you can have this angelic experience too. Uh, yeah, of course, I'll pay for the next thing. So then the next step is teaching you how to do that to a woman. Yeah. I mean, all right, I, <laughs> this is probably my own like cult, uh, cult stuff. But in their language, they would say, you don't do it to a woman. You do it with a woman. Like there was this oh. strong feminist thing. Whereas, I mean, I don't know if you're interested in the history, but the previous organization doing was a lot more patriarchal. It was like literally called doing D O deliberate orgasm. The man did the woman, like she was out of control and he controlled everything. Mm -hmm. And then Nicole's one of her contributions to like this lineage, if you call it that, um, was making it a lot less asymmetrical and pro feminist where, you know, she would even say like the woman is stroking the man back through her clitoris, which is a little bit metaphorical, but it's a way to look at it where like the man and the woman are on the same page, um, which I think also made it a lot more marketable, right? Like most women wouldn't want to be like in the control of a man they just met, but like this kind of symmetrical relating was a lot more, I think, feminist friendly. Yeah, that makes sense. I think where it gets tricky is... Uh, it seemed through the documentary as you got further and further involved as a woman in the organization, it became not your choice anymore or, or they felt like they were forced to be subjects to people who were learning how to do it and they didn't really feel in control of their body. Did you get a sense of that when you were in or do you think that was an exaggeration? No, I think, well, it's one of those things that you can frame it many ways um, because there is truth to something of like being of service to people and helping people and sharing your good feelings. But obviously with like, when it comes to something so intimate, it is a bit of an extreme. And I think it's one of those things that's kind of confusing where, uh, I think at that point, a lot of people got confused over what they want because there's a lot of conflicting desires there. Um, and yeah, I mean, it is a lot easier to just uh, say yes when you're unsure. And I think they took advantage of that that kind of moment a lot in people. Okay. Yeah, because they framed it in the way that there were droves of men signing up, but no women to actually try it on or to learn how to do this with, right? Yeah, that that was true in, on the West Coast. Um, my experience on, in New York was there was actually too many women. Um, So they did the opposite with like, they would like put men in the class for free or like someone like myself who was experienced would be put in the class for free to like gender balance the room. Um, So that that wasn't true in every city. I think that was a San Francisco thing. So all of this so far seems pretty like, okay, yeah, we're going to teach these men how to orgasm with women. Um, That's great. And then it gets further in. So then we have people living together in this warehouse in San Francisco. We have like BDSM dungeons, which nothing wrong with a BDSM dungeon. I just want to illustrate how it just kept getting deeper and deeper and deeper. So these people are all living together. They're part of the organization. Maybe they're in the coaching program and now they're having sex with each other nonstop. They're doing all of these things that kind of elevate the experience but it doesn't necessarily feel like a consensual situation anymore or some people are getting pushed into things they don't really want to be doing, but they're living in this situation. So how do you really get out of it? Were you living in a type of place like that or was it different in New York? 
Yeah, no, I was in the first like one taste New York house of that of that time. You know, I they did the coaching program in 2013. I moved into the house that March. Um, and you know, at, at that phase, like when you're like a new coaching program student, it's all consensual, right? Like there, it, there's just like a lot of fun opportunities. Like if you're like a bohemian young person who really like is a seeker and wants to like find him or herself, um, it's like, well, hell yeah. I've, I mean, I'll, I'll live with these like free spirits. You know, it's like a, it had the vibe of like an ashram or a sixties commune. Like my first six months in the house were so fun. It was like being in a reality show because like <laughs> it was it was really like do whatever you want. It's a bunch of like young, uh, not not everyone was young, but like, yeah, just like expressed, like happy, spiritual people. Like we all did yoga. We all meditated. We all ate healthy. We all like told the truth to each other and were vulnerable. Like it was so much fun. And it was so freeing. And then at a certain point when like you've really taken a lot in then they start, they, they kind of flip the script on you. Um, one of the lines they used was, you, you, you come in as a party, th you, know, you come in as a party goer, but at some point you have to become a party thrower. And, which means like, you, you can't like take forever. Like you have to at some point give back, which in itself is actually a very true and beautiful concept, right? Like with anything, you know, like 12 step, anything like service and like helping other people when you feel full is a totally true thing, right? No one can deny that. But then they use that to get you to do things that benefit the organization while also sometimes helping people and helping yourself too. Like, again, it wasn't total bullshit, but it was like used as a, you know, a tool. So what were the things that they would eventually ask you to start doing or um, participate in that you weren't really planning on initially? Um, I mean, at the lowest level initially, like you just help out at events for free, which, you know, no one would say yes to you when they first come in, but after a while, like these have become your friends, like you love hanging out. It's like, yeah, I'll help out at the event for free, right? Yeah, I'll help at the next class for free. It's kind of fun. And like, there's always like this next ask, ask that, you know, once you're invested enough, it's not that hard to say yes to either because things are fun, which is mainly like the draw in the beginning, or where at some point you start to feel an obligation, or like this is your spiritual path. You know, I mean, that that wasn't really my thing, but just the idea that I, I needed to give back after, you know, having uh, benefited so much like that. That's kind of a pull that gets you deeper and deeper into the organization. Like, don't you like you've had an amazing last six months. Don't you want other people to have that, too? And of course, the answer is yes. Right. If you have a heart, the answer is yes. So like, oh, yeah, I'll volunteer my Saturdays or I'll do this and do that. And um, at some point when you're deep in enough. I think everyone experienced this where something really isn't fun, but at that point you're so invested that they can reframe it as, oh, this is your resistance. This is, you know, this is your opportunity to step into fear. Whereas like for me, it was selling people on these expensive programs. Like I had this like very strong resistance to it or like, um, you know, they, they, just to be clear, they didn't, they, there's no pr like literal prostitution, at least when not when I was there. But sex was often mixed up in the sales process. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of people have resistance to it, but it's like, oh, well, you're kind of helping the person here too. And like, this is your opportunity. This is your edge to like push through. And, you know, that then it becomes like a downward spiral from there. Yeah. What is that line? Because Nicole says, yeah, I'm selling sex. I'm selling things you can't buy on Amazon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and so these men, at least how it's framed is these men are being told, oh, yeah, we're going to sell you this sex and you're going to the seminar and whatever. Um, and then you have these women who are working for the organization that are told, like you were saying, oh, don't you want to help somebody? You need this. You need more orgasmic meditations to release your own stuff. So go and provide for these men. So isn't that basically prostitution then with these women who are kind of feeling obligated to give of themselves for the men who are paying for it? Well, no one paid for Ohm. So I would say, no, it's not prostitution. Like you could say it's another gray area, but no one literally paid for sexual things, right? Like maybe they paid the organization and part of what goes into being in the organization is that you have certain, you have access to certain experiences. So not really, not directly at least. Okay. More of like an indirect gray area. Yeah, because, you know, and this was true for men too. Like, you know, well, well, first of all, just for context, like if you were an Omer, if you were in this world, 
you were oming every day. Like you were doing this practice with different people. It was, it was just part of your lifestyle. It's like, you know, if you are a serious tango practitioner, you dance with a lot of people. That's just kind of how it goes. Um, and uh, if you were part of the staff or you're an experienced omer, it was kind of seen as like this thing that you do with with people. And if you're a newcomer, that means you have more access to dance partners, if you will, than in any other situation. So it wasn't it wasn't like anyone literally got paid or paid for sex ever, as far as I you know was there. But you know, you could say you know there was uh, sex was definitely mixed up in sales for sure. That brought up something really interesting. Um, so you're saying if if you're an omer, you do this every day. Does this include anything more than uh, clitoral stimulation? Is there actual penetration happening between the members? Uh, that's that wasn't part of like the communal practice, but obviously, I mean, just like in a dance community, like people are going to hook up. Yeah. <laughs> and obviously this kind of practice is like, if you kind of like someone or you're maybe interested in someone and you just, you just stroked genitals with each other, well, then the barrier is very thin, you know, to go to the next yeah. thing, right? So it definitely facilitated certain things, uh, you know, as in any social community. Yeah, but as far as the actual practice goes and the basically what you signed up for, it was the men stroking the women, right? Typically. I mean, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, lesbians who stroked as well. Right. Um, but yeah, if you're a man in this community, uh, yeah, that's the only thing you're doing in the beginning, at least. That's what's also really interesting. The power differential is shifted. Normally, it's the man leading the community patriarchal structure but here you have this community where men are basically serving the women i 100 percent agree with and can see the fact that the man is still getting something from this experience i just find it interesting that she was able to build such a multi-million dollar thing on men just stroking the women i mean how do you feel now like looking back what was that like for you being a man in a matriarchal structure and did you feel like it was really beneficial to have that type of structure or i think uh as a 24 year old guy who is very disconnected from his feelings initially to be in this very feminine world was super beneficial i mean just for myself just like to get in touch with my own feelings uh, relationally, super useful to learn how to empathize and like not think so much when speaking with someone, whether in a sexual setting or not. Like that, that was super beneficial. With that though, I mean, the matriarchal structure, the, the female centric society did kind of like, like to be called masculine was one of the worst. It was a it was a pretty bad insult in the one taste community. Like you're being too masculine. Like wow. that was like, oh, you're too in your head, you're disconnected from your feelings. Like that was like a not like a cruel thing to say, but it was kind of something you didn't want to be called. Like that that wasn't like cool in the one taste culture. Um a man who was in touch with his feminine was cool, right? Um a man who could hold the feminine, let's say, you know. That kind of thing was, I mean, I still think it's true, like to be able to empathize with a woman and like give space for her feelings is useful. But in the in, in the one taste community, men kind of were put into like a servile role. And any man who was like too, let's say manly or masculine found himself in an uncomfortable position. And a lot of times they were pushed out. Wow. Okay. Because I'm all about integrating the feminine within any gender mm -hmm. and, uh, but the feminine and the masculine, there has to be that balance there. And to think that that was demonized is really, really interesting. And what are your thoughts on, do you think this is why it came out in distorted ways? For example, the part of the documentary that talks about letting out your inner beast, where you have men who are violently shaking and hitting and saying, I want to rape you to these women, and they just have to take it. And they're just supposed to embrace this inner beast and be turned on by this inner beast. Do you think that could be a contributing factor as to why that kind of went that direction? Well, I, I did think that was one of the things the documentary put out of context, like the idea of being like the, the being a beast. It's not different. I think I said I think they kept this line of mine in, in the documentary of like it's like being a savage in like our modern colloquialisms, like just to be uninhibited. Um, 
they did go into taboos, which I think was useful in that, you know, someone who has a rape fantasy in either direction, women or men receiving or giving, you know, that's a thing that a lot of people have a hard time coming to grips with. And it really was a safe space to share weird things or things that you're afraid of sharing. Um, as far as I directly observed, it wasn't like, well, it's like we gave space for each other to share their, their vulnerabilities in, in all directions. Um, it wasn't like, it wasn't like anyone said rape is good or that that should be a thing. It was more like, if you have a certain urge, we can at least talk about it. No one's going to shame you for it, which that in itself I thought was very positive for everybody. I think there was healing moments between men and women who maybe had the opposite ends of those things or like resistance to the other or resentment at the opposite sex that were able to like kind of let go of those kinds of things. Um, there were moments though, where, you know, when convenient for one taste, if someone did something not cool, it, it could always be twisted in a way that, uh, you know, seemed okay based on their dogma or teaching. I'm all about the open communication. I think that's really healthy. But when you have this open communication around something so vulnerable such as sex and you're telling women that don't be a victim if you're raped, it, it kind of breeds this environment that is ripe for assault, which is really scary. Um, even in a, a female-led organization where they almost feel too safe to where they don't know when it's not okay anymore. It blurs the boundaries and it kind of blurs those consent lines. Mm -hmm. And I think oh, the one part that just riled me up so hard, Ruan, is when she she's like, we should make these t-shirts that said, um, I raped someone and all I got was this, or I got raped and all I got was a victim story. Mm -hmm. And I just lost my mind. I was like, no. And then she said, she said, you can't, uh, the way to get out of rape is to get turned on. Like, you can't rape someone who wants it. I was just livid. I paused it and I looked at my fiance. I was like, no, this is not okay. Because it's it's kind of, it's telling women that, oh, if you're being raped, just like it. You should just consent. You should just give in. You should submit and be turned on by it. And that just... I could not deal. So was that taken out of context or did they actively teach this that in order to be in control of your sexuality, you just had to be turned on in any situation? Uh, well, I do want to preface this by saying I don't feel totally qualified to really comment given that I'm a man. Uh, unlike, you know, the you know how uh, useful it is. I, I did hear her speak a lot about dropping victim stories. And I did see that being useful. Um, there was one thing that I shared with a lot of female friends that I thought was interesting of like, and I, I again, I have no personal experience of this, but uh, like if you're getting catcalled, if you get upset or contract or, you know, somehow get flustered, you kind of encourage the other person to catcall you more. Whereas if you throw, you know, in her term, it was throw the ball back. Like you, you say something provocative back at them you know, the person catcalling you will kind of get thrown off and the power's back in your hands. And I, I asked a lot of my fr my female friends about what they thought of that. And a lot of them thought it was interesting. And some of them thought, you know, tried it and thought it was a, like a cool, empowering tool. Um, but then, of course, it, you know, with everything in one case, it, it got taken to a level that, you know, they did show the minority of that conversation in the documentary, the worst parts. But there was a lot more context to it. Not to say it was right or wrong, but like it was generally about uh, doing what you can to not be a victim in the situations that you are, from my outside perspective. When it comes to the catcalling thing, that's actually really funny because years ago I did a skit on my social media about that. As I called it when you catcall a lion. <laughs> and I did that exact same thing where they're like, hey, baby, what's up? And then I'm like, oh, what's going on with you guys? Which one do I get? Do I have to pick? And then they just don't know what to say. Uh -huh. So I think... There can be some truth to that. Um, I did it as a joke, obviously, but that could also be harmful and dangerous, just like any advice. There's two different ways it could go. It could work. It could also be detrimental to where the man thinks, oh, there is an open invitation. I am going to go after her in a, a sexual way and maybe something bad happens. So 
I can see how there can be positive and negative to all of this, but I do think, at least from an outsider's perspective, it went way too far. Um, I wanted to talk about the the priest initiations. Mm-hmm. Were you ever involved in one of those? No. I mean, there's only one that I believe happened, and I was in the room for it. Oh, okay. So how <laughs> can we talk about <laughs> yeah, it? Yeah, totally. Of course. The priest initiation. Um what they showed were lots of like uh, like a rattle going around like a naked woman and then a snake comes out and I was like, oh, hell no. Like I am not in the room for that, <laughs> for that giant snake to be wrapped around me. Um, the women are naked except for a black mask. And it's basically like, and this is just from what I gathered on the documentary. So I want to hear what actually happened but it just seemed like a giant orgy where women are just coming and then get the snakes and it they described it as a sexy illuminati type of initiation so what was it actually like yeah well those, i mean i think you're referring to two different events there was the stinson beach demo okay uh and then the priest initiation i think they're like 10 years apart oh okay there's a lot of th- so it was a, a newish event called magic school uh and that was the first time it was done so i uh, one taste was kind of going a normal corporate direction. This is like 2014, you know, they had a partnership with CrossFit. They taught all the CrossFit HQ how to ohm. No, that that's often lost, but that was a thing that happened. Um, you know, they had all these endorsements. They were going in a very normal route. And then I think because of that, Nicole, I mean, she actually said this to me in one of our few direct personal conversations was that now that she achieved this amount, she could do what she, she could expose like what she's really into, which is like occult stuff. So magic school is kind of like the coming out event for this. Um, in the maybe six months prior, I uh, like more religious terminology was being used, like more magic at first, like in a tongue in cheek way. And then it slowly became kind of real. Um, or like, you know, used seriously, I should say. And magic school was like a bunch of different rituals Um, one of them was this priest thing. So I mean, I have to give a little bit more context for this too, about the priest initiation. So at this point in 2014, one taste had been running their coaching program for a while. So like, that was like the, the, the last step in terms of monetary, like money that you could give. I think that year they, they created the Nicole, they don't intensive, which was $20,000 and eventually $40,000 for a two week intensive. And, I, you know, this is my interpretation, but I believe this to be true. Like, they're looking for what's the next big thing. Like, how can we charge people $100,000? And one of their moves was to sell the individual branches because there were, there were developed branches in uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, London, New York. And they would sell these branches as like, a, they were called affiliates, but kind of like a franchise to certain wealthy members of the community for close to seven figures or, or, or more than seven figure amounts. Wow. And they did this with the major cities, San Francisco, um, Los Angeles, London, and New York. Uh, the men who bought in, and I don't know how much each guy gave, but it was maybe a quarter million each because there was maybe each city was split amongst five people, men and women, but the men were kind of exalted, I mean, literally exalted as priests because as kind of like a, a social reward for having committed their lives in a way that I, you know, one of the functions was to maybe make all the other men jealous that they didn't commit themselves so deeply. Like they literally had a status as priest. And at this time, you know, I was pretty well known in the one taste, the world one taste community. And a lot of people came up to me after the the ritual. I'm like, oh, how come you weren't one of the priests? And if I'm honest, I was like, yeah, how come I wasn't one of the priests? Like I did feel that kind of like. You know, they, you know, FOMO essentially, and they used FOMO and they literally talked about how using FOMO to get people to do things. Um, and this is one of the more extreme versions. So describe for us then what it was like being there for this type of event that just seems like a big old orgy. <laughs> uh, well, you know, it wasn't an orgy. It was uh, the, there were seven women. It was Nicole and like the top ranking uh, women in one taste. They were naked. I mean, I realize I'm saying this like as if it's normal, but, it, you know, it's obviously not. <laughs> so casual. <Yeah. laughs> I mean, it, just to me, this was not nearly the, you know, this wasn't close to the weirdest thing, uh, at least at the time. Um, 
they had black veils as described in the um, in the documentary. Although I think any footage that they used was um, was recreated. I don't think there, there weren't any um, uh, cameras there as far as I know. Um, the women were on seven massage tables, just like an ohm demo. Uh, pussies facing outward, which is how they would say it. And then the men wanted it like they would rotate every few minutes, like who they were stroking. And at some point, I believe Nicole gave them like a necklace that had a moon on it. I believe that's what it was, a necklace with a moon. And that signi signified that they were a priest of orgasm. Wow, a priest of orgasm. So what if they're a priest, what does that make her? Do you feel like anyone worshipped her in a religious type of way? Totally. Um, it was never directly said, but, you know, is, and this ties to the, the, the desire thing that you asked about earlier. It's like you go in and you're learning to live by desire, but then they kind of morph your desire to be what one taste wants and who is the biggest authority on sensing your desire but Nicole. So in that way, she is kind of like a deity figure. No one explicitly said that, but that was essentially what it was. Interesting. Uh, There's another course um, a year before magic school where Nicole was the demo model. Usually she was the one stroking, but in, for this, it was called mastery. Uh, she was the model and she was stroked by someone else. And they played all of this angelic music and she was dressed kind of like an angel. And all of those theatrics certainly were to spiritualize uh, her in one taste. Okay. You said that the priest initiation was not the weirdest thing you saw. What was the weirdest thing that you saw? <laughs> uh, hmm. <laughs> My sense of weird is maybe different than most people now. Uh, in the mastery course that I mentioned, which was a six-month program, we did all sorts of exercises with each other that was unusual. Um, like, aside, I mean, because the idea behind mastery was that you're learning how to bring ohm principles into other kinds of sexual acts. So that was my intro to BDSM. That was like, you know, all sorts. I mean, I, I'm not going to list them all, but like all sorts of like it, the menu of kinks that you could think of, like we tried them there uh, live. And that was, I don't know. There's a lot, also a lot of spiritual things that were weird. It's kind of, it's kind of hard to answer that question uh, succinctly. No, that's okay. Um, so then did you find yourself just dating within the group of omers or were you trying to date outside and if you were dating outside of the group how did you kind of go about your sex life or did you explain any of this like i'm a master stroker or anything <laughs> it was a little uh, i mean it was a bit of a mix of both like if you're in the om community and you're you know of course, you know, people are hooking up. Like, that's like a normal thing. A lot of polyamory was the norm, like, especially early on when I was inside. Anybody who was monogamous was seen as like kind of this strange backwards person. Like, what? Like, you, you only have one partner? Like, <laughs> not, not explicitly. Like, no one was explicitly shamed, but it was seen as like a strange thing if you were a monogamous. Um, funnily enough, by the time I left, so many people were polyamorous that the edgy thing was to be monogamous like that was like the crazy thing if you were monogamous uh that was when i was leaving initially of course that's you know i was just spending all my time in the own community but as you were shifting to you know a quote party thrower it was kind of expected that you brought people in too especially if you had the ability to and uh it was kind of seen as like a service you were doing to the community or the orgasm in quotes which was kind of like how we saw the Tao or God, if you will, um, again, tongue in cheeky, but like also like metaphorically real on, on a level. Um, it's kind of expected that you're bringing people in, like, especially if you're really like walking, walking the talk, like you're really expressed and open and meeting people and magnetic. Like, of course, you introduce the people that you meet to this thing. And one taste did teach people like men and women how to be more attractive, like, if you can really learn how to sense people's emotions and not be shy about sharing things and like be open and obviously you're in tune with your body, like that does make you attractive, like whoever you are, more attractive. And uh, yeah, it was like a normal thing. And it's seen as kind of like a cool thing if you're bringing people into the young community. So then these women that you would meet outside, you would tell them, oh, I'm part of this uh, ohm community and I know how to make women orgasm. Were they like 
cool, let's do this? Or did you find out that there was more apprehension from outsiders? Uh, well, I wouldn't say it like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, but of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, you know, I do this practice. It's just kind of like someone saying like, hey, I do yoga. You'd be like, hey, I do this practice called OM. And they would ask me about it. And then I would tell them. And it was always a very fun first date conversation. And it was mostly met like no one ever thought it was weird uh or maybe people thought it was weird but like people were not everyone tried it but like people were of course it's interesting or just like walking the watching the documentary is interesting you end up on a first date with some guy or, or some girl who seems really cool some woman who seems really fun and attractive and she does this thing and you maybe you want more of what she has so you try it yeah, on one hand, it could be seen as a party trick, right? Like, mm -hmm. guess what I can do in 15 minutes? Mm -hmm. um, but then on the other hand, and maybe this is me and my own wounding and triggers, if I found out this guy I was interested in is getting multiple women off a day, I'd be like, mm, hard pass. Like, <laughs> I'm going to want someone that's just to myself. Um, so it's interesting that you didn't really come across that. But I'm curious uh, how you went from an OM member paying for the coaching community to an actual employee. And I know we don't have a ton of time here, but what was it like for you being an employee and trying to sell people on these expensive programs? And then at what point did you realize that this wasn't healthy for you anymore and you needed to get out? Um, well, there's many layers to that. Uh, the coaching program itself was kind of like a way of fielding people to become employees i mean uh even even looked at like if we look at it like less cynically like the people who are the most dedicated students in the in the coaching program were probably like the best picks to spread it right and i think that's how everyone who wasn't um nicole probably looked at it like we're we're trying to recruit more of our own people essentially so i was amongst like you know every si maybe six months in the coaching program like five or six people were hired out of um, each city, essentially. So I was part of the New York team, and someone else. I think one of the women in the in the documentary said this. It was like uh, a lot of the employees were young people who didn't didn't have a career. So it wasn't like it wasn't a hard sell. Of like, hey, this thing that you do all day, why not get paid for it? So I, I was like, oh yeah, hell yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, I'll be an orgasm coach. I, I would have laughed at that earlier, but by <laughs> now it was okay. Yeah reasonable. Um, and just like every level within one taste, the beginning was super fun. It was like, we would wake up at seven. Uh, we do the own practice. We would do like our meditation and yoga and whatever. Then we'd have a team meeting and then we'd talk about like how we were going to get more people to own. And it was just this fun thing where basically me and my best friends at the time were trying to get more people to do what we did. It was like super fun, super, super. It was like the most, it was like the best job for like a month. <laughs> For then I month. realized we weren't getting paid. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no. I, re I realized we weren't getting paid. And also the excitement that kind of fueled us in the beginning of like, because we didn't sleep. And I do think, I do attribute this to the vulnerability and the intensity of the community, but also like all the sexual energy, if you will. Like we were just like kind of like hopped up all the time, like always turned on, always like on. And for like, basically when I was an like employee, we would work sometimes or we'd be up doing one taste things from 7 a.m. till past midnight, seven days a week. Oh. And at first it was fine because it was fun. Um, and then at a certain point, of all of us crashed, of course. Um, and I also realized that we didn't get paid. <laughs> and, and I don't know why I was the only one of the five people that complained about it. I guess I was the most concerned. Well, money is helpful. So I don't know what they expected and how they thought they would get away with just not paying their employees. They, they're really good at twisting things. Like I felt bad. I felt so guilty every time I asked about money and they, they framed it in a way of like, I, mean, I always felt like I was the only selfish materialist person because I wanted to get paid 2000 bucks a month in New oh York, right? Gosh. Like I felt so, like I felt, ah, uh, like, and no one else was doing it. So I'm like, oh, I must be, I'm, I'm the asshole here. Like, I'm going to do it, but I'm the asshole. And they, you know, that was my own, you know, 24 year old insecurity, not being able to really stand up. But uh, yeah, that was used against me. Like the times that I really put my foot down, I was shamed in front of everybody and laughed at, like not being evolved enough to like realize that money is not the answer to things. Uh, meanwhile, the company's making millions and millions of dollars. Right. Um, but I, you know, Everyone's working on less than a minimum wage.
That's insane. Yeah, they said, uh, what, 12 million one year that they made? I mean, it's just the manipulation is crazy to me because, like you said, you're in this state of mind where hypersexual, hyperactive, you have these really emotional connections with these people, you're being vulnerable, you're exposed, you are just in it as deep as you possibly can. You live with these people. It's your life. You eat, breathe, and sleep sex, basically. Mm -hmm. And so when you start to use your critical thinking again, like, wait a minute, I think I need money to eat or to go somewhere, and they shame you for it, it really just screams cult mentality to me. So at what point did you start to catch on, oh, this isn't okay, and I need to get out of here? I felt funny about at this point, like being employed of like how much pressure we put on people to spend lots of money. Um, I wasn't sure about it because like, you know, I was being a kind of, uh, I, I was a little bit bought into the idea that maybe I had sales resistance, you know, it's the same kind of thing you would see in a normal like sales office too. Like you're afraid to sell kind of thing. Um, so, but the, then I saw like how, you know, they kind of manipulated people's relationships to get them to spend more money. Like a lot of times, a younger, attractive person would be kind of, in a sense, like encouraged to be with like a person with money so that that person with money would pay for both of their expensive courses, maybe drop 30 grand for both of their coaching programs. And a lot of these things, like, it's not like it was like a light bulb moment, but it was a lot of like, ah, oh, something about this feels a little funny. Um, and at some point, you know, I, I did I did make it clear to myself that at some point I was going to leave, but it wasn't clear when I was going to leave. I mean, I was still having a lot of fun and I was still growing a lot as a person. And I was trying to like see if I could balance the two things. Although, I, you know, maybe a year into one taste is when I acknowledged they had a pretty dark side. Oh, interesting. So you were in it a full year. And was that the length of the coaching program before you turned employee? Maybe it was like six months in. I was hired at six months, maybe seven months in I had this revelation or these feelings came up, I should say. And I stayed in another year plus, the year and a half. Okay. So total, you were there two years? Am I, can I do yeah. math? <laughs> I can do math. Yeah. <laughs> um, wow. So two years of your life were dedicated to this organization, which you said seemed fun at first, which they always do seem fun at first. And then you realized it was taking a toll on you. Um, but what was that actual that actual moment where you realized that you had to leave? Because I know, at least with Mormonism, this is my experience, just to kind of put words to mine, was just a little at a time, something on the shelf. Like, this doesn't feel right. It's fine. Um, Don't really feel comfortable with this, but I'm just going to leave it there. I'm just going to not deal with it. Until eventually, it was a moment with my someone in the church who was just shaming me and guilting me and making me feel like the worst person on the earth when I realized I'm going through all of this pain and suffering and what if this church isn't even true? And then I just started doing research and was like, oh, it's made up. Yeah, I'm out. So was there a moment like that for you that was rock bottom or was it just one day you're like, yeah, I don't think this is serving me anymore? Yeah. The, what planted the seed of like, okay, I need to leave at some point was actually pretty early on. I met certain people that call themselves lifers, meaning they basically gave all their money or spent all their money. Like there was no beyond one taste for them. And, you know, some of these people, you know, maybe they didn't have a lot of options, but a lot of them did like a lot, like there were people who, you know, they could have done a million things with their, their life, but they chose to commit to one taste. And that was kind of like my, you know, it's like the moment in the scary movie where you realize like, Oh, this is not, <laughs> this is not a place I want to get stuck. Um, but honestly, I would have stayed longer if I wasn't pushed out. So essentially I was trying to get as much as I can from the experience before I left. I was thinking maybe a couple of years. Um, I wanted to write a book, which I eventually, I mean, I'm writing now. Uh, and I was trying to kind of skip steps where I was trying to get close to Nicole without having to commit my life to the organization, without having to, you know, cut off all my options. And uh, we spoke about writing a book together. And that was that was where my few like direct conversations with her uh, came from. She agreed to it. But kind of from there, you know, anytime someone in One Taste had status in the community, they were kind of a liability unless they committed to the organization. So basically, I was getting a lot of pressure from One Taste staff to uh, commit my life and become a lifer, essentially. 
Uh, and I kept saying no, I kept saying no, I kept saying no. And basically when they realized they weren't going to get me for life, they pushed me out because at that point in my interpretation, I was a little bit too influential to not be committed to the organization for life. Um, so yeah, they pushed me out and I had to leave after two years, which was probably the best time, but I would have stayed another year or two if I, if I had, it was up to me. Interesting because yeah, they love their celebrity endorsements, right? Like Tony Robbins endorsing her mm -hmm. book and also Gwyneth Paltrow endorsing it. So, but that makes sense where if you're a little too influential and you have something bad to say, then it's total will backfire. <laughs> so, right. so then they kick you out and how are you feeling? Do you, I mean, I know the feeling after leaving high demand religion uh, slash cult where you're just like, well, now what? Like, what mm -hmm. do I do now? And everything is still painted with the lens of the programming that you came out of the cult with. And you're trying to get your feelers like, what is reality? How do I really feel about sex? Do I still want to believe in this? Do I still want to use these practices? What are some things that you gained that you feel were a positive thing? And what are some things that you are still, if you are struggling with? Well, the stuff I mentioned earlier about like empathy is like a thing I learned, I, you know, I re, you know, reconnected to like, in one taste. And that was, that has always been, you know, I think it's making me a better parent. I think it makes me a better husband. I think it just, these are things that I will forever be grateful for because I, I can't imagine what my life would have been like if I just stayed a closed off, you know, emotionally distant person. Um, so that was great. <laughs> but yeah, my first, I, it was hard to tell at the time, but looking back, maybe my first year, it was very hard to like get back into like the quote real world. Like everything, I was a, a little bit mixed of cynical, like to disconnected, like, and I thought it would be very easy to go back to my old life, but I didn't realize how far I had gone. Cause it wasn't like we were isolated. Like I was still interacting with my friends and family. I was still like out in the world, but I somehow was like within the one taste world more than the rest of the world. And um, I found it very hard to relate to people. Honestly, I found it hard to relate outside of a sexual setting. Like I, I didn't know how to do anything other than this thing that I had become a master at. Trained a lot in. <laughs> yeah, well, I wouldn't. No one would say that. But like, <laughs> <laughs> but like, it was like the only way I felt kind of comfortable. And there was a period where I really thought I messed up my life because I was like unemployable. I couldn't relate to people. Everything normal in the world seemed so boring and dull. And I, so, so your other point, like. Is there anything I'm still working through? Not really. Like I, I don't feel like I'm a victim at all. I am living a very happy life. A lot of positives have come from my one taste experience. If I'm really honest, and this might sound weird, I do partly miss the intensity. Like actually, what like with the Netflix thing, a lot of controversy popped up in my regular social in my in my life. Uh, a lot of fears came up, and a part of me was. A part of me found it fun. Like it was like old times, like where everything's intense and like there's the stakes are high and you're having deep conversations with everybody. And I, you know, I, I love my friends and life and everything now, but it's different. Like I, it's a normal life that uh, is different than the fun, exciting cult adventure life. Oh, that makes sense. Where everything is just heightened. I yeah. think that's um, that's a very common thing among a lot of cults where it's high demand. I mean, that's why they call them high demand religions. <laughs> um, all of your time and energy is put into this. You associate with people who agree with that and who are also on this high stakes mission. And when it goes away, it's kind of like, oh, what's my purpose now? What do I do with my life? And how do I relate to people that don't have this incredible to them purpose of changing other people's lives? Uh, Interesting. Did you feel like you really were and have changed people's lives from the people that you recruited into this? Uh, it's a tough question. I think many people experience the same positives that I have. I think a lot of people have a much darker view of their experience than I do. And some have a lighter experience too, but uh, you know, I know a fair bit of people that were in it with me 10 years ago and are still like reeling from their experience and that that that's really unfortunate mm -hmm. which is why you know for all the positive things i have to say about one taste I, i'm not i don't I, I feel no obligation to protect them because they have caused a lot of harm and i do get a lot of heat from some x1 tasters for like speaking negatively about nicole because they're still viewing her as a deity or something 
Um, but yeah, I mean, they've hurt a lot of people. I, I don't feel bad about saying anything that I say. Yeah, I think just with any cult, there's always going to be people who just have different experiences and people internalize things differently. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Some people leave uh, Mormonism completely unscathed and they're like, I'm great. Why are you so upset? And it's like, well, let me list all the reasons why it was damaging. So, of course, that makes sense. There's going to be layers to it. Um, Okay, well, I've talked your ear off. Before (laughs) we go, do you have a Linda Listen statement? Something that you want to say that maybe pissed you off something you want to say to Nicole or something inspirational that you would like to say to our listeners and viewers out there. Linda, listen, very few things are good and evil and a lot of good things can be used for evil purposes. And a lot of evil things have positive effects. So you're standing by your um, newfound skills of female orgasm. (laughs) Well, I wouldn't give them up. (laughs) I mean, why would you? And also saying, be careful because things can always go to dark places. Yeah. Anything that's beneficial can also be used against you. That's a great point. That's a great point. I'll take it. And uh, for anyone out there who's curious, Ohm is still alive and well. I mean, it's not the same... Um, or OM, One Life is alive and well. It's not the same organization, really, I don't think that it was before. Nicole has stepped down and sold her shares. and uh, But they actually just had an event in Los Angeles two days ago, which I found very interesting. Mm-hmm. So um, if you're curious, you can check that out. But I, I can't say after even our conversation that I would recommend it. I think there can be other places and resources to help you learn orgasmic meditation um, or learn how to get a woman off without joining a cult. So that's just my two cents. What do, what do you think, Ruan? Uh, their how to own class is pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, don't buy anything. Okay. And Nicole still runs it, of course. You know. Oh, she does um, still run it. Yeah. Interesting. Of course. Of course. Okay. I mean, the cult. I mean, she stepped down from the corporation. Uh-huh. But of course, she's still like she's the she's the leader. Right. That's her baby. Um. Okay. Well, thank you so much for sharing everything, like your time, mm-hmm. your your thoughts, your experiences. I know they are very vulnerable. And um, I want people to be able to connect with you and find you if they so choose. So what are your social handles? Lay them out. Uh, I share most of my things, cult-related and not, on Substack, ruando.substack.com. I'm also serializing my cult memoir there for all the details I could not share here, that's at ruando.substack.com. And I'm on Instagram, but honestly, I don't use it that much. So you could just check out my Substack. All right. My podcast is there too, where I told, tell my full cult story. Amazing. Well, do you have any final thoughts before we go? No. <laughs> no, we covered it all. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much again for everyone listening. If you do want to support this podcast, I would really appreciate if you wanted to become a, a patron over on Patreon. I have the link below. Um, and until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious, and be well. Thanks for listening. If you like what you hear, it would mean a lot if you could like and subscribe on YouTube and leave a review or a comment to help with our visibility. You can also find me on social media at Colts to Consciousness or reach out by email at Colts to Consciousness at gmail.com.